Um, welcome everybody to another um, MTH218 online meeting. So um, the meeting today, I hope you can see my um, screen, is looking at um, triple integrals and change variables. Um, if you've got people got questions, they can fire as I go through. So what we've looked at um, last week, and that was the last few times, I should say, is how to do integrals when you've got functions of many variables. So in particular, we looked at double integrals, and we haven't quite finished um, all those things to consider there, which I'll mention in a second. Um, but they're pretty much how to integrate when you've got variables of uh, functions of two variables. Um, but I like to consider how you do integrals of functions of three variables. And the answer is, it's the same sort of process. Um, and indeed, the same process would apply if you've got many, many variables for that matter. Um, but I want to focus on this one a little bit just to um, give you a bit of practice um, with them all. Just to see some ideas. Uh, the difficulty, as I'm, I'm sure you'll encounter when you get to it, is the concept of trying to visualise things. And that's how it gets really hard. Now, as always, um, fire questions as you want to away. So, um, so this uh, question at the top here is um, basically what I want to consider. I've got a, I'll have a tetrahedron. I'll try drawing in a second, um, given by some points. Uh, let's assume that it has uniform density. I'll say one kilogram per meter cube, something like that. Um, let's work out its mass and also work at its x coordinate of the center of mass. Um, so that's sort of the problem we've got in our minds. Um, so with lots of these sort of um, problems, instead of trying with triple integrals, I think it's often easiest to visualize that you've got some sort of 3D solid out there in integrating over this 3D solid. So I'd like both of these things here, whether you're trying to work out its mass or center of mass or something else to do with it entirely. And that's often the best way of thinking. It's sort of trying to jump into some higher dimensions to try to work out that we're integrating between two hypersurfaces or something like that, um, which although is all true, it makes visualization just impossible. So I think the best way of thinking of these things is working out the total mass of some sort of 3D solid. So therefore, the way of trying to do it is um, try to visualize as that volume. And if you can, try to draw it in 3D. Now that can be hard and not as important, um, but it gives you at least a framework, even if you could do it roughly. What really is important, though, is looking at um, what the base is, or what the projection of our solid is onto the xy plane. I call it the base, which it base very much when it's sitting on the xy plane, or if it's sitting above it, it's a sort of shadow it casts on the xy plane. That's important to draw. And that's going to be the key key ideas of what we have to integrate over. And that is the least achievable to do. Once you've got that base, um, you knowing bounding surfaces, you can then work out the limits from that approach. Um, you might need to do other, because it's a, a double integral, because, um, sorry, once you've got the limits, that might lead you to other things. So otherwise, just a pre approach like we did last time, or using integrating integrals. But as you're doing it, uh, you go from a triple to a double to a single integral. When you get to the double integral, you might notice from your pictures, for example, that you have bits of a circle. That would suggest that your polar coordinates transformation at that point in time would be helpful. And other tricks as per necessary. So that's the basic approach. Let's just try what it looks like in this situation. So let's just try visualising it. So we've got our um, x, y, plan, x, y, z. Um, we've got a tetrahedron, so a triangular pyramid. Um, it's got vertices at um, x equals 0, y equals 4, and z equals 2. So we've got a point up here. That's our first point. Um, x equals 3, and y equals 
4, it's another point, um, x equals 0, y equals 4, and z equals 0, and the last one is the origin. So roughly speaking, we've got a tetrahedron, so a triangle pyramid, um, passing through those points there. So that's my attempt at trying to draw it a 3D solid. Now it's a tetrahedron, so I've got a chance. If it was a curve at the top, then they can get um, pretty difficult to do. And so you can go, well, I know what the top and bottom is and leave it at that. The main purpose for this picture is to work out what the top surface is and the bottom surface. which helps with the limits. And if you can work that out without pitch, using a picture, go for it. Um, the bottom surface in this picture is hopefully clear, um, is the xy axis, yep, um, and that's z equals zero. So it's the easy one. Um, the top surface is a little harder, so we'll leave that for the moment. Um, but we, need, we do need to come back to it. So the other picture we need to do is looking at the base. And that basically is the, the shadow this casts on the xy plane, or the base, which in this case they're synonymous, um, which would be this little triangle on the xy plane. So I just want to draw that. The xy. And so um, that becomes this triangle here. And again, we just need some points. So when y equals 4 and x equals 3, um, so this point here projects down, is that point there effectively. And we're going to look at this region. So this is the base. And this again would be really helpful for limits. So now we've got a visualization. These pictures will help us work out what the limits are um, that we can do some integrals for. And so if we look at this top surface here, which is this sort of triangle. This is a bit of a plane, um, and therefore we will need to work out the equation for a plane, essentially. Um, and the points, just label them again, uh, that'd be 0, 4, 2, 3, 4, 0, and the origin. So that's our so basically, pretty much, we've got a plane passing through these three points, and therefore we need to use the appropriate formula to work out an equation for a plane. Now, do you know how to do that? So, we did this, you've done this a while ago in another subject probably. So, um, first of all, you work out vectors two vectors parallel to the, in the plane, so we'll call them A and B. And you work, the way to work them out is you take one vertex, so 0, 4, 2, minus another one, one will be the origin, that's the easiest to extract from, and that gives the vector A. And then take another another point, subtract off the same common point, and that gives you A and B, two vectors in the plane. Then a normal to the plane, then a normal to the plane would be the cross product of these two vectors. Uh, and we'll do lots more vector stuff um, shortly when we do the third part of the subject. So good revision of what some of these things are. So the way I do cross product, um, you just mind your mnemonic. So write down ijk is the three coordinates. Write down the coordinates of a, 0, 4, 2 and B would be 3, 4, 0, and then just take the determinant of this expression. Just a way of reminding me how to do it, really. And so the I component, which is the first one, would be 4 times, would be the determinant of what's left over, so this bit here, which would be 4 times by 0, minus 2 times by 4, gives you minus 8. Going across the row, um, 
it alternates signs, so it'd be minus j. Yep, and so it'd be zero minus six, so it's minus minus six, so it's posit ends up being a positive. Just put it in clearly. And the last one, if you get the last component is So alternating sign, so it's positive and be minus 12. Yep. And so the normal is minus 8, positive 6, minus 12. Um, you can, you only care about the direction, so we might as well just say it's, par you can just divide by constant, so it's parallel to, say, minus 4, 3, minus 6, for example. Then once you have the normal, then you pretty much do the x, y coordinates minus some reference point, which in this case the origin, and then dot product with the normal gives you a zero. That's the basic equation for a plane. So in this case, um, x tilde is short for x, y, z. Um, the origin is nothing, so it's going to end up reducing down to minus 4x plus 3y minus 6z equals 0. So that's the top surface. So it took a little while. And since we want to integrate between those two things first, it's going to be best to rewrite this as z is equal to something, just to have that as a clean limit for our integral. So make z the subject um, we minus um, yeah, minus write it, write it is. So minus 4x plus 3y over 6 which you can simplify um, but let's not worry about it. So let's just copy that down so the top surface, after quite a bit of work, really, is minus 4x plus 3y and 6. So we got to the, the top surface and the bottom surface. Now, in other situations, that's easier to work out, um, either because it's told you quite closely in the question or I mean, it has a more natural form. This one had a bit more work involved. That gives the bounding curves for the z's. Now we need to find limits for x and y's. And this is the picture here. So we're going to work out limits for x and y. And we can do it. We could work out um, this is both a type 1 and a type 2 region, so you could pick either or. Um, in this particular case, um, we're going to work out the x coordinate. And so it's going to be easier to integrate x last, probably, because the x is in the way. And so therefore, I'm going to work out um, y is, I'm going to consider this region between two functions of x first, so therefore I integrate y last. And so the top line here is y equals 4, and the bottom one, um, past the origin, and when x equals um, 3, you get y equals 4. And so y equals 4 thirds x would be the bottom curve here. And then lastly, x goes between 0 to 3 as elements of x. So once we've done all of that, and a bit of work, no doubt, um, we can now work out some integrals. So the mass of something is a triple integral over our region of the density, in this case is 1, dv. And the x coordinate of the centre of mass, x bar, is 1 over the mass times by the triple integral over the region of the density, which in this case is 1 times by x 
um, dv. So this is the formula I want to use. Um, I'll do this second one using the integrals. Uh, let's just make an aside. Let's just show you how you can do some of these things easier. Um, so when you're doing the mass, when you're doing the triple integral of 1 dv, that just ends up being the volume. So that's just sort of the definition. But if you do a the volume of something is just a triple integral of 1 dv, that's sort of definition. Um, that's a useful trick if the, if the solid has useful volume, which it does in this case. So this is a triangle pyramid. Do you know what the formula for a volume of a triangular pyramid is? Okay, you may not. You may, may not. Just wait if you respond, that's all right. No, that's all right. Um, so the volume of a pyramid, so this is, so we've got pyramid here, is um, one third times by the um, volume of the prism. And the prism is, say, the cross-sectional area times by the height, which we'll call C, say. Um, and then the cross-sectional area, so let me try that again. So it's one third times the area of a prism. A would be the area of the base for a pyramid. So um, the area of a base, if it's a triangle, like a triangular pyramid would be half um, times AB, for example, times by C. That's the area of the base. And so you can see that this, the volume of a, pyramid would be 1 on well, 3 factorial or 1 on 6 um, times by um, the perpendicular height in each different direction essentially. So these all have to be perpendicular to each other, which it is in this case. And so ABC would be, ends up being um, the base, if you look at the top here, picture here is four and three are the two different dimensions and the height's two. So you're getting four by three by two all divided by six three factorial which is three times two, which is the answer four. So I can without it without using any integration whatsoever. Um, which is easier. And that's useful tricks to know at times. So by all means um, sometimes in assignment questions I are forced to do integrals, um, but when you don't, you can do it um, using some of these tricks at times. And certainly using an integral, integral of one to get an error of volume is really helpful. So let's go back to the um, the second question, and we will do this one explicitly because you can't always use tricks. So the x coordinate of the center of mass would be one over the mass, which we worked out as four. Then the triple integral of x dv. And now it, what we need to do in order to evaluate it using the integral methods directly would be to use limits, specify the limits. Um, and so since I, for my picture, I've worked out as being between two surfaces first and then between between two functions of y and then lastly between just limits of x. That's sort of how I specify the region when we'll look at above. So that's my, the differentials. So for y, the bottom surface was at equal zero and the top surface was um, minus 4x plus 3y and 6. And then for y's, um, from my picture up here, I can see that y goes from between 4x and 3 up to 4. So again, they just become my limits. And then limits for x was 0 to 3. So using those pictures I had, or at least if I couldn't visualise it, the top and bottom surfaces, um, allows and work out what these limits are.
And I missed that top bit, didn't I? So that's our integral. So before I go about doing the rest of it, it's good just to take a step back on what I've done here, and that is to work out a triple integral, um, you do it like a double integral, and the first bit really is to find the limits. That's the first bit. Because you've got an, an, an higher level dimension, because it's a, a 3D solid, the finding these limits can take a little bit more effort to do. And the way to help you to find these limits is draw the solid if you can, definitely draw the base slash shadow, and just to try to help you work these things out. And take your time to work them out appropriately. Um, and I didn't check my answers, but you can check your answers, so you can check the normal as I worked out, etc. So this gives my limits. Now to work it out, I just do it just like I do every other time, and that is really to do it as an iterated integral. Now because my regions are you know, triangles, etc., that should be fine as it is. If I saw some circles in my drawing my pictures earlier, that one might make me think polar coordinates would be a good idea, but we don't really have to worry about it. So pretty much we integrate inside out, so integrating of x respect to z, just to give you xz, between z equals 0 and z equals minus 4x plus 3y and 6, and then we'll integrate the outside bits later. Um, you yeah, write down the answer, presumably. Now, I won't do the whole thing, because we're out of time, but some things you could do here is, and I could have done it in the first step, is I can factorise some things out. So this x here is independent of the y, and so I can actually factorise it out to the next level integral the next integral because it is independent of the y. The 6 is independent of everything, so I could go and I could take that out as well. And so I could say this is equal to 1 on 24, you know, from 0 to 3, x. 4x and 3, 4, um, minus 4x, plus 3y, in respect to y, then x. And this is a double integral. Um, and you could proceed um, slowly like using that sort of approach. Um, and I won't. And I, well, I can finish it off if you want me to. I'm more than happy to. But um, um, I am happy to skip it as well. Would you like me to do it? <coughs> okay. So, yeah, that's fine. Um, if you keep going, you'll eventually get the answer. But if you keep saying, so just go one at a time. Depending on the integral, they can get complicated. So just some hints, I guess, some advice of how to do these sort of things. And that is, at each step, you can completely simplify the integral down, which means expanding all the polynomials, etc. That's one way. Um, Particularly if you're not quizzing integrating three times, sometimes the number of terms can blow up quite substantially before it collapses down to a single constant. And so that, so uh, an alternative way, which sometimes is helpful, not in this case admittedly, um, but it's only in other situations, is to use the reverse chain rule. So instead of being tempted to expand things out all the time, um, rather use the reverse chain rule and that means you can keep some things factorised for a bit longer and that might make the number of terms a lot less and therefore easier to handle. Um, I'll show a similar sort of trick a little bit later on in 
the next few examples. But certainly can arise naturally in this sort of situation. In this case, it's fine. It just falls out with a bit of patience, essentially. Um, so that's how you do triple integrals. Um, you can do them. There's a few special cases um, that's worth sharing. And it's worth mentioning just for your assignment, if nothing else. And that is, if you've got a uniform density, like it is here, and you've got a tetrahedron, like I've got here, then the x-coordinate, um, or indeed any other coordinate in the centre of mass, is just the average of the x-coordinates of the individual vertices. So the coordinates, vertices are 0, 3, 0, and 0. So you do the average of those four numbers, you get three quarters. And that ends up being the... So if we kept persevering, and then I'm getting three quarters is the answer. And so in your assignment, there's an assignment question um, like this. Um, and in that situation, you are forced to do an integral. So you have to do the integral method, So because I tell you to. But you could check your answer um, using that sort of approach. And if you want to know where some of those results are, that's in one of the optional appendices optional sections towards the end of chapter two, which has some of those results in there, if you're curious. But that's one that's worth mentioning, I think. Um, so that's triple integrals. And as I said, um, helpful to think of them as being solids. Uh, there's some of my pictures. Okay, so uh, now we've looked at triple integrals, which is good for the handler thinking of solids and 3D space, and looking at double integrals, which is useful um, for looking at air, bits of area, etc., integrating over um, an area. Um, what are the basic strategies for how to do it? So this is my um, basic plan of attack for model integrals, looking at all the different methods that I have presented and I'm just about to in the rest of the lecture today. So the basic plan of attack is to try to draw the regime integration. So just like the triple integral, we drew the solid if we could, um, certainly the air 2D air, and we'll always do that for double integrals. Once you look at your region, try to see if you recognise it. So for 2D integral, so for double integrals in particular, is it a type one, is it a type two, is it polar coordinates? You know, they're the ones you're looking for. Um, really hard ones would be, I could split it up into a sum of various type 1, type 2 polar coordinates, polar regions. For each of these standard regions, just do them as an integrated integral. Now, sometimes when you try that approach, it fails. And so there's two good backups. So one good backup is if you just try it as an integrated integral and integrals become really difficult, then maybe a way of making it easier for you is to reverse the region of integration. So instead of integrating x, then y, do the other round, so y then x. And that works so long as the region is both type 1 and type 2, that's a valid strategy for you. And I gave a simplified example of that two online meetings ago for rectangle coordinates, but you can do more sophisticated ones um, for general regions as well. Um, the last thing we can do is if the region of integration is complicated, you can transform the region and indeed the whole problem using a change of variables. And that's what I want to focus on now. Um, in this subject, I'll give you the transformation to you because there's a lot of work just finding the transformation um, normally. Um, and depends on your linear algebra school. So if you've got, um, if you've got done lots of linear algebra, uh, then there's some lots of ability, then there's lots more, um, then you've got a great, much greater ability to work at what these transformations actually are. But given not everyone has done that by this subject, um, I'll just give them to you, make it a bit easier. Um, so this is the change of variable. So before I spend too long on that slide, uh, let's just um, do something different. So we have dealt with integration with the change of variable before with one variable. So this is a um, some function, so x is in some 
domain, so A to B for example, um, then what we do is we make a substitution, x equals a function of u, so x equals su for example, then the integral then becomes integrating for u is in um, an appropriate set of u values to match the domain, that's how you sort of write it down, and then the function of um, u's instead, and then just make everything match up. Uh, we want to change the differential, so what we do for one variable, we change the limits, that's what I've got here, so change the limits, um, we change the integrand, and we change the differential, so we go from dx to u, and in order to make it fix up, we have to introduce a, a diff derivative in the middle, so dx to u. So this is the approach we do for a sub integration wide substitution. Um, Technically speaking, we really should put absolute value signs here. Um, we don't, in, not in Maths 101 or 102. Um, the reason why we don't put it in Maths 101 or 102 is because um, we can take care of it quite easily by just swapping all the limits quite happily. And we can do that. Um, when you're dealing with um, multiple integrals, um, it's really useful to put absolute value signs on, this, on the equivalent um, thing just here, just so you don't have to worry about marking around with the limits. So that's the basic approach for one variables. So you can see that um, it's in your rational substitution, and you have to substitute the limits, the integrand, and the differentials. And there's this extra term cropping up, which ends up being the derivative. So we want to try to generalize an approach, so do integration by substitutions effectively for two and three, etc. variables. Um, I'll only present the two variable option here, but it's the same approach for all of them. And then you have to some transformation. So U's and V's give you X, Y's, etc. Then the integral here um, Um, is equal to, you have to change the limits, so this is all, I mean, so you have to change the limits appropriately, um, you basically change the integrand, that's the integrand, you change the differential, and in doing, by introducing the change of a differential, you have to add this extra term in here, um, and instead of being derivative of just one variable, it's both at the same time. So, there's a bit of bit of work on all these sort of things, uh, I'll show them more carefully too. Um, this thing's called the Jacobian, or Jacobian determinant is a long name, um, and this is absolute value signs, so it's an absolute value of the Jacobian. And I'll explain what all these things are, but essentially this is just a generalisation of integration by substitution, that's all it really is and using the same sort of ideas. Now, in the, um, the study guide, go through some explanation where some of these things come from, etc. Uh, I'm just going to try to utilise it. Okay, so just a few things to help us visualise. So for one variable, we can give it the transformation as either x equals some function of u, or we can say u is equal to some function of x. I mean, we give both types of substitutions um, when we deal with integration by substitution of one variable. And the same thing applies here. So you can um, do change of variables two different ways. And so there's the problems approach are similar, a very similar sort of approach, but they're slightly differently. And these two are inverses of each other. Just give you a name for it. Okay, so let's look at the big picture and look at the details, and then I'll see if we can come back to the big picture again. Um, so basically, in this subject, I'll give you the transformation either as x and y are functions of the other variables, or the other around u and v is a function of the x and y's. Um, depending on the problem, you might need to actually work out the inverse, so the other way around, so you know to flip them around. Um, not necessarily, uh, but 
be prepared to do that. And you can do that using uh, matrices, as I'll show you in the few examples I've got here, um, or simultaneous equations, etc. if you need to, etc. Um, then we need to just replace everything we've got. So we need to change the limits, change the integrand and the differentials. So we'll need to change all of them. Changing the limits um, depends how you do it. So if you've got a, a linear transformation and polygon, you just sub the points in to the equations and it gives them all to you. Um, if you've got a more complicated shape or nonlinear transformation, you really have to do each side directly. Um, I won't do example that difficulty in today, but there's only one in this in study guide if you wanted to. Um, you have to change integrand. That's the easy part. Just sub in normally. And the last one is to change the differentials. And that's mostly revolved around finding this Jacobian. And the key thing is make sure it's make a positive, take absolute values. So what is this Jacobian? Um, well, the Jacobian, if you write it as use Vs, give you X and Ys, is pretty much um, the Hessian matrix, which is just a, a square matrix of all the past derivatives, and then take the determinant of that, like each of the Jacobian determinant, and then we take absolute values, a normal in practice. So that's what the Jaco Jacobian determinant is. Just some big words there, but basically a um, matrix of all different past derivatives, then take the determinant. And again, that, that same approach works for high dimensions if we ever wanted to. Um, because we often have the transformation the other way around, um, you, if you have the variables the other way around, um, it just takes the reciprocal of that. So if you have the, um, the Jacobian of the inverse transformation, um, so there you go, the Jacobian of the inverse transformation is a reciprocal of the normal transformation. So if you happen to have it the other way around, it's just easy to work at the partridges of what you've got presented to you. Um, just work the Jacobian as per normal and just do one over that um, to give the answer. Um, I don't think we have time for both of them, but... So let's have a go at one extended example for it all. Okay. So, um, just deal with this transformation in its own right and then we'll come back to it. So, um, we've got a Jacobian. Um, oh, so, we've got a transformation. X is in terms of U's and V's, Y is in terms of U's and V's. Let's find the Jacobian. So, the Jacobian, first of all, requires us to find all the partridges. So, we've got X, U, X, V, Y, U, Y, V. So, that's the matrix we want to find out. And we want to take the determinant of this matrix. And the Jacobian is the absolute value of all that. So that's the, you write it down. So first of all, let's find these partial derivatives. So um, this is x up here. What's the partial derivative of x respect to u? Maybe you can just type it in. Yep, so 3 partial derivative with respect to v is 5. And then partial derivative of y respect to u is 3. And the last one is 1. Yep. Um, now, this is a linear transformation. And so these numbers just happen to be the coefficients of the u's and v's, which is common for, um, which is only common for linear transformations. Uh, for nonlinear, you get other things happening. So then we have to take the determinant. So the determinant of 3, 1, 5, 3 is 3 times by 1 minus 5 times by 3, which gives you minus 12. That's, that's the determinant. And take the absolute value, gives you 12. Now, just want to really sell this, that that absolute value is really important. So what it's doing is, um, it's when we work at the limits, a little bit later on, so you have to change the limits. You have to keep, if it's the transformation um, changes orientation, um, you have to keep track of that. And so one, when it's a minus one, that's when the orientation gets changed. In that case, 
either you have to do a little fiddle to make sure that the limits match up, or if you absolutely value signs, it does it all for you. You don't have to worry about it. So normally, it's it's so hard to fiddle the limits, it's just not worth it. Chuck them to their fines, make it all happen for you nicely. So if you don't do it, normally get a sign error at the end. That's the, the bottom line. So that's what the Jacobian is. So let's just apply it to an example. Um, let's just draw a little picture. So um, let's go to integrating over a triangle region. Um, so triangle um, got a vertex at minus three, zero, at zero, three, and at one, two, two, one, thereabout. So we got a triangle, something like that. This is our region. So we're integrating over this region here. And we want like we would like to integrate this find this particular integral. Um, is the integral of x over six. So this is actually happens to be the um, x quadrant for the center of mass. So just so again you can visualize very much the two object. Um, but it could be anything. So it's in, it's working at the average of this value function over this particular triangle. Now, if you look at this integral directly, so I guess I said, first strategy, I think, with any double integral is just draw a picture, which I've done. If you look at it, it's still on a side, it's still in a circle. Um, it's not a square, they're the easy ones. Um, but it isn't a type 1 or a type 2 region for that matter either. So a type 1 region um, would be uh, having a top curve and a bottom curve. Now the bottom curve is fine, the top curve is still okay, I can draw it quite easily. It's just got two pieces to it, which would require, if you do it like a top one origin, you require to split the whole thing up into two pieces. And similarly, if you want to do it as a type two, that would be the bottom, which is fine, but the top again has two pieces to it. So if you were to try to approach this using the methods we've done before, really would require us to split up into two parts, one one or the other. And so two do lots of integrals. So another approach is to try to transform this triangle into a different one. So basically I want to transform it, so transform T to make it into a nicer region. One where the triangle is much easier, and um, the triangle will do. It would be this one here. So um, tricks. I'm not going to explain everything to you, but a, pro a basic, a good approach is if you're trying to integrate any over any triangle, is you transform it into the um, canonical um, sort of simplex is called a the default. This is a, called a simplex, and again any hydrodimension, so tetrahedron, there's a sort of standard a thing to transform it to, etc. Um, and so there's processes for doing that, that's sort of the formula for it all, as I've written down here. Um, at the end of the day, I will just tell you, this is the transformation. There's a reason where it, there's certainly a, a natural choice for where these things come from, applying for triangles at least. Um, Etc. So you've got to change your variables. So now what I want to do is, I, looking at the picture, you can see why the direct approach is going to work. As soon as you see the change of variables gets mentioned in your question, you go, let's do it that way. That's pretty much the way to do it. So what do we have to do? Well, we're going to have to do a few things. We're going to have to change the integrand. Okay, that's easy. You have to change the differentials. Okay, we need to use the Jacobian for that got the top. The only other thing, the other thing we need to do is change the limits. That requires a bit more work here. So pretty much we need to work out what appropriate limits in the U's and V's are. And so we've got, this is the XY space, and we need to know what it looks like, and I'll tell the answer, but normally would know the answer. What does it look like in terms of U's and V's. Now, if it's a polygon like this one, and and 
um, linear transformation like this one is too, you can just sub points in that does it nicely for you. Um, there are other tricks um, which I may have time for you to show you, or I'll, I'll make time to show you. Um, so in this case, let's try subbing in. So you look at the transformation, you go, I want to find U's and V's, you go, oh, hold on a sec, I can't actually sub in how it's written because this is saying X in terms of U's and V's, I want the other way around. So what I need to do before I can do anything else, really, is to find that inverse transformation. So as I said before, um, depending on the problem type, you may need to do the inverse transform. In this case, well, we've just tried to not do it if we could, and realised, no, no, we do need to do it after all. So that's what I have to do. Um, you can do it using simultaneous equations. So just these two equations solve for u and v simultaneously in terms of you know, use only in terms of x and y, v in terms of only x and y. It's doable. Um, I'm going to do a matrix approach. So if I added um, 3 to both sides, so I get x plus 3 equals 3u plus 5v and y equals 3u plus v. I can write this as matrices now. So x plus 3, y is a vector. Is my matrix 3, 5, 3, 1 times by uv. It's using the linear algebra we've seen from, say, Maths 101, or something equivalent. Um, then I can move this matrix in the side by just tying inverses. So I can take the inverse of this matrix here. would now give me u's and v's. So if I, I'll work this out in a second, but basically, if I've got a linear transformation, I just, we know enough linear algebra techniques, say from maths 101, to be the inverter matrix to get the inverse transformation. And since we know how to do this directly, I find that easier. Um, as I said, you could do simultaneous equations and get the answer too, by all means. Um, so, how do you work at the inverse of a matrix, of a two by two matrix? Do you remember, or do you need it? I give the formula. So if people don't remember, um, you've got A, B, C, D. The inverse of this, um, for a two by two case, it's just the classical adjoint's easiest. Um, so you do one over A, D minus B, C, which is the determinant, times by swap the A's and D and then put minus sign in front of the other letters. It's called a classical adjoint approach, which is definitely the best in this situation. For higher, so make bigger matrices, um, then you might have to use Gauss elimination like we learned in Math 101. So in this case, um, first of all, we have to work at the determinant. So it's AD minus BC in this particular case. <coughs> I'll let you work it out if that's okay. Just waiting, that's okay. Yep, so exactly as you write down. So uh, minus 12, then we just swap the diagonal entries and put a minus sign in front of the off diagonals. And so we see that uh, UV then is just this matrix times by x plus 3y. So the inverse transformation then is U would be equal to, take the matrix products, um, X plus 3 minus 5Y over minus 12. And V is equal to um, minus 3, X plus 3 plus 3Y. Three minus 12. So that's the inverse transformation. So we take the inverse for it. And what's that, why is it useful is in I can now 
plug in my points. So my points were minus three, zero, zero, three, and one, two. So they're my three points. I can now sub them into my inverse transformation and work out exactly what the U's and V's are going to be to work out this this new region. We'll give them the new limits. So just plug them in. So if I plug in x equals minus three and y equals zero into this, you get um, zero. So when x equals minus three and y equals zero in this one, you get again zero. So basically this point, so let's just do my little pictures. Oops. So we've got is this point here is getting mapped to the origin. That's what it's trying to say. That's what we've got so far. So the next one, x equals zero, y equals three. Again, if you plug that into here, you get um, that's zero. Three minus five times three minus 15 gives you one. If you sub in zero and three in this one, um, you get zero. So that says that this point here is getting mapped to u equals one y equals zero, that point. And we do the next one, so we've got one, two, which is this point here. Sub x equals one, um, gives you, so x, um, let me just draw it there in the right way. The might make a bit, 2, 1 might maybe be better. <laughs> get the right answer that way. So x equals 2, y equals 1. If you plug that in, you get 0 here. Um, plug in here, you get 5 minus 15 um, plus 3 minus 12 gives you 1 after division. So that this point here gets mapped to um, v equals 1. And because it's linear transformation, um, they all just join up nicely. So the straight lines get mapped to straight lines by linear transformations. That's, what they, that's sort of one of the reasons why they're called linear after all. And so this triangle it gets mapped to a much nicer triangle for us. And this line here would be, say, u plus v equals 1, or say v equals 1 minus u. Um, if you notice the orientation, so if you go from red to blue to green, um, the direction of the t of the orientation is swapping. Whenever you get that, that's when that that's the minus sign cropping up in the Jacobian before Jacobian determining. That's the minus sign where orientation swapping swapping. And I picked it deliberately um, in this inst in this instance to. It emphasize the point, but you know you could easily get it, like in this case. So now we've done some pre-work. Now we can um, do what we need to do. So we've got our original triangle region here of x on six da. So first of all we need to change the limits. So when we change the limits, we've moved off to this much easier triangle. Um, and so we'll integrate, say, V first, and the bottom V gets is V equals zero, top V gets is one minus U, and then the U's go between zero and one. So my new region, which a picture is again handy for, ends up being um, those particular limits. Next, we need to change the integrand. That's x on 6. So I need to go back. Well, what's... So over 6 is fine. That's the easy part. The x, if you scribble all the way to the original question, we had... Um, 
x equals minus 3 plus 3 u and 5 v. Well, let's just plug that in so we know what x is. So change the integrand like you can see is often just plugging in what we have. So minus 3 plus keep forgetting 3u plus 5v. And then last, we need to change the differential. So first of all, we're changing the dx dy. That's what it really was. So it's dx dy from before. We're changing that to the new limits of du dv. And I'm integrating v first, so dv in this case. And then I have to just put in the Jacobian in this case. So that's the Jacobian. which is what we worked out at the very top of this page here. And if you notice that um, it's cropping up in this formula here too. Um, so there's lots of connections here. <coughs> so now we've done the transfer, now we've transformed it, we've gone from a integral over a difficult region, which had to split up into a much easier one. And then you can sort of approach this um, directly. And sort of, I mean, the 12 and 6 cancel out for a start, and then you can integrate these things sort of directly. Um, uh, let's just do this integral. So before I do it, um, the 12 and 6 just gives you a factor of 2. Because I've got a 1 minus u there, and I notice I've got a 1 minus u cropping up in the middle here, I'm going to write that down explicitly. So it's minus 3, 1 minus u, plus 5v. You're going v and then u. So when I integrate this term here, I get minus 3, 1 minus u, v, plus, say, 5 and 2, v squared, and I'm plugging in so the two limits, so when I plug these things in, when I got the v, instead of trying to expand, I realise I've got 1 minus u times 1 minus u, I've got 1 minus u squared. And again, I got the subbing in the v here. I got one minus u squared as well. Plug in zero gives you nothing. So by noticing the one minus u, and I've got a similar bit here, I could factorise it. I can actually save the amount of terms I've got in the process. And here, instead of having to expand and simplify, etc., I go, oh bang, I've got two one minus u squared terms. Let's just put them together. Um, so minus 3 plus 5 and 2 gives you minus a half times a 2, let's get rid of that, will give you just um, minus 1. So it gives you minus 1 minus u squared du, which looks nicer. Um, then instead of trying to expand, I just re use reverse chain rule. So if I use reverse chain rule, I... Um, integrate normally, so bump the power by 1, divide by the new power, and then divide by the derivative of what's inside. The derivative of what's inside is minus 1, so they, the minus ones cancel out, and you just plug in 0 and 1. If you plug in 1, you get nothing. If you sub in 0, you get a third, and so the answer is minus 1 third. So one of the purposes of this approach is just look out for using reverse chain rule just to help save set some of the algebra. So take us to big, big picture. What do we do? We had a, um, we're given a question and it very much clearly says use the change of variables. And in our situation, that's normally the signpost. As soon as you see that going, okay, great. I'll just approach this, do it directly. 
when you're doing that, um, just having you back in mind that you might need to work out the inverse transform. And if you ever get stuck, just do it. And maybe it's just good to just do it straight away. Um, once you have that at your disposal, um, work out the new limits. And that normally requires you to either sub in points to get what the new, what the new points will be, or if the bounding sides are given by a function, you might be able to recognise it quickly. I'll mention it very quickly next time in the next example. Work at the new integral, probably by subbing in, and work at the new differentials, which really requires working at Jacobian, either using one of these two formats. So if it's a, um, depending on how the transformation is written, so as this first problem, I use this one directly. If I had not x and y is equal to functions you the other way around, I'd use this approach instead to work at the Jacobian probably. And you can always go, and if you work at the inverse, you can always transform the problem to this type quite easily. So if you're used to more one more than the other, go for it. Um, so last example I'll talk about, um, but I won't, I certainly won't do it all, is this one here. So this is another um, integral, and it says you change your variables. So again, in an assignment or exam, go, oh, bang, I'll just use this approach. Um, if you look at the region, this is the region is integrating, it's integrating a parallelogram. Again, this is not a top one or a top two region, so if you were to have to try to do this directly without a change of variables, it would require splitting up um, the integral into three different regions, which would then all be type one or type two regions, depending on how you do it. And so, and it isn't, and that would require three triple, int three double integrals, and you can see integrating two x minus y all squared. Um, that would require look at lots of equations for lines, and it doesn't sound like lots of fun. And so, the change of variables, which although is time consuming, um, um, is an appropriate way of doing it. If you look at how the parallelogram specified, it's 2x minus y equals 1, 2x minus y equals 10 are the two of the sides. So this sort of suggests you go, well, why don't I just let u be the 2x minus y? And so the other two sides are parallel. Why don't I let v be the common bit of the two of them as well? So that's sort of a natural transformation given how the, the picture is drawn. So u and v are just the sides. And therefore, Um, for the limits part, at least, which is the part I want to mention. So this region here, if I let u equals the 2x minus y and v equals 5y minus x, then this is going to change into being, well, this will become u equals 1 this will become u equals 10, this is just v equals 13, and v equals 4, and so I've got 1 to 10 for the u's, 4 to 13, so I would change this whole thing to a well, square, as a matter of fact, not a very good square, but a square. So this particular case is, I didn't have to work out the coordinates of the points because this is a transformation given the other way around and because of how the sides are specified, I could transform a whole side and ended up being easy in this particular instance. So you could work out the points, um, as a matter of fact. Um, they were given the question, they're listed in the question here too. Um, and you could work out like I did a second ago. Um, but in this case, because of how the pattern is just got, let's just substitute the whole side, that makes it whole much quicker. And you can see it. So that would help you work at the new limits. To work out the new integrand, so the integrand was 2x minus y squared. Um, since the 2x minus y is just u, I'll go, well, that's just u squared. I don't have to work out the inverse transformation in this case. I could just see it, which is great. Uh, and the only, therefore, the effort in this case would be to work out what the Jacobian is. And you have because this is the given specified in an inverse fashion, the easiest way of doing that would be this sort of approach. 
So work out the Jacobian sort of as written and then just take the reciprocal. Let me just do that to finish off. So the Jacobian normally is um, you know, X Y's in terms of U's and V's. That's what it normally is. So differentiating X Y's respect to U's and V's. We've got it the other way around this time. And when you do that, you're going to take the partitive of the U's and V's respect the X and Y's. No, absolute values can trace per normal. So in this case, um, we've got the U's and V's take partial with respect to X and Y, so partial due to this one with respect to X is 2, respect to Y gives you minus 1. Partial due to the V respect to um, whoops, X gives you minus 1, order's wrong. Partial due of V respect to Y gives you 5. So it's part, just doing the as written pretty much, it's much easier to try and do in inverse transformation. Um, that's take term is 10 uh, minus 1 gives you 9 and since we're doing normal transformation on the inverse we get 1 ninth as our Jacobian and we don't have to protect absolute values because it's already positive. So this particular integral um, would be, as I said, the new limits are given by this one here, so you go from 1 to 10 and 4 to 13, I think it was. The 2x minus y becomes u squared and the integrals become 1 on 9 uh, and we did du dv. So that's our new limit, new differential, u integrand, new limits. And this particular one, sort of a fair lot more nicer, just because the transformation we picked really matched the picture very nicely and therefore it become easier to do. And so this other, the inverse transformation approach sometimes actually is easier, like you can see in this case. And since it's rectangular, um, ends up being useful. Also, because it's all rectangular, you can split them up. So I can integrate the, the V's bit and the U separately. Um, integral of 13 to 4 dV is just the difference of them, that's just the length of it, so 13 minus 4 is 9, that gives you 1, because 9 and 9. And integral of U squared would be U cubed on 3, between 1 and 10. Um, sub and 10 you get 1,000, sub and 1 you get one of course, take the difference is you 999 on three, and so the answer is triple three. So that integral fell out much nicer, which is nice. But it's the same approach. So the basic steps are similar, as in the same steps here, but because they're, it's the inverse approach, some of the some of the the details for these steps come a bit differently. So what I'd like you to do is um, be prepared for either of them. So in your assignment, um, you have a change of variables question, um, and it stands out across the thumb because it tells you it's one, um, and it's one of the approaches. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. But be prepared in your exam. You know, again, change of variables is a really good... Um, you're very, very likely to get one, but it may not be exactly the same type as you did for your assignment. So make sure you practice both approaches, both methods, um, while you're now before the exam to get ready for it. So just sort of summing up what we've done today then is we've finished off looking at uh, multiple integrals, we've looked at triples and how to do the last of the more sophisticated techniques for um, multiple integrals, namely change of variables. Um, make sure you catch up um, 
with everything. That's fine. You've got a little while before assignment two is due, uh, but that's enough. Once you have got on top of this in terms of tutorial questions, you should now be able to complete assignment two. Um, just a word of warning with assignment two um, is that question one has a bunch of questions not in the necessarily the order we've covered it. And so part of the issue is trying to do the problem solving. And I think as I mentioned before, uh, the first approach you try may not work successfully because it might just get too difficult. So be prepared for the alternatives. Um, so yes, so if you get on top of this week's drill, um, you should be able to do assignment too. Definitely. So what we'll do for the next online meeting is I'll start the next, um, sorry, what I'll do next online meeting, um, so just after Easter, is I'll start looking at chapter three, which is getting ahead, uh, but I just have to do that because Anzac Day means I have to bring something forward. Um, so that's how it is, but, so all the best with getting things done. Um, and if you've got any questions as it goes through it, which, um, it's quite a natural thing to do. Um, fire away, please. Awesome. So if you have any questions, ask now, but otherwise I'll, I'll think I'll finish it up there.